Act One of R. U. R. by Carol Capek, translated by Paul Selver, eighteen eighty eight, nineteen seventy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. R. U. R. Rossum's Universal Robots by Carol Capek, translated by Paul Selver and Nigel Playfair. Robots of the World. The power of man has fallen. A new world has arisen. The rule of the robots. March. Characters. Harry Doman. Read by Todd. Sula. Read by Tina Broughton. Marius. Read by Roslyn Carlyle. Helena Glory. Read by Sarah Terry. Dr. Gall. Read by Barry Stryford. Mr. Fabry. Read by James Callahan. Dr. Hallemeyer. Read by Steve Toner. Mr. Elquist. Read by Beth Thomas. Consul Busman. Read by Steve Toner. Nana. Read by K. Hand. Radius. Read by T. Lane. A servant. Read by Ethel Bus. Helena. Read by Sarah Terry. Primus. Read by Todd. First robot. By Tina Broughton. Second robot. By Kitty K. Third robot. By Mary K. Fourth robot. By Roslyn Carlyle. Narrator, read by John Trevithick. Act I. Central office of the factory of Rossum's Universal Robots. Entrance on the right. The windows on the front wall look out on the rows of factory chimneys. On the left, more managing departments. Doman is sitting in the revolving chair at a large American writing table. On the left-hand wall, large maps showing steamship and railroad routes. On the right-hand wall are fastened printed placards, robots' cheapest labor, etc. In contrast to these wall fittings, the floor is covered with a splendid Turkish carpet, a sofa, leather armchair, and filing cabinets. At a desk near the windows, Sulla is typing letters. Doman dictating. Ready? Yes. To E. M. McVicker and Company, Southampton, England. We undertake no guarantee for goods damaged in transit. As soon as the consignment was taken on board, we drew your captain's attention to the fact that the vessel was unsuitable for the transport of robots, and we are therefore not responsible for spoiled freight. We beg to remain, for Rossum's Universal Robots, yours truly. Sulla, who has sat motionless during dictation, now types rapidly for a few seconds, then stops, withdrawing the completed letter. Ready? Yes. Another letter. To the E. B. Hoyson Agency, New York, USA. We beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 5,000 robots. As you are sending your own vessel, please dispatch as cargo equal quantities of soft and hard coal for RUR, the same to be credited as part payment of the amount due to us. We beg to remain, for Rossum's Universal Robots, yours truly. Sulla repeats the rapid typing. Ready? Yes. Another letter. Friedrichswerk, Hamburg, Germany. We beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 15,000 robots. Telephone rings. Hello? This is the central office. Yes. Certainly. Well, send them a wire. Good. Hangs up telephone. Where did I leave off? We beg to acknowledge receipt of order for 15,000 robots. 15,000 R. 15,000 R. Enter Marius. Well, what is it? There's a lady, sir, asking to see you. A lady? Who is she? I don't know, sir. She brings this card of introduction. Doman reads the card. Ah, from President Glory. Ask her to come in. Please, step this way. Enter Helena Glory. Exit Marius. How do you do? How do you do? Standing up. What can I do for you? You are Mr. Dolman, the general manager? I am. I have come... With President Glory's card. That is quite sufficient. President Glory is my father. I am Helena Glory. Miss Glory, this is such a great honor for us to be allowed to welcome our great president's daughter, that... That you can't show me the door. Please sit down. Sulla, you may go. Exit Sulla. 
sitting down. How can I be of service to you, Miss Glory? I have come... To have a look at our famous works, where people are manufactured, like all visitors. Well, there is no objection. I thought it was forbidden to... To enter the factory? Yes, of course. Everybody comes here with someone's visiting card, Miss Glory. And you show them... Only certain things. The manufacturer of artificial people is a secret process. If only you knew how enormously that... Interests me? Europe's talking about nothing else. Why don't you let me finish speaking? I beg your pardon. Do you want to say something different? I only wanted to ask. Whether I could make a special exemption in your case and show you our factory? Why, certainly, Miss Glory. How do you know I wanted to say that? They all do. But we shall consider it a special honor to show you more than we do the rest. Uh, thank you. But you must agree not to divulge the least... Helena, standing up and giving him her hand. My word of honor. Thank you. Why don't you raise your veil? Of course. You want to see whether I'm a spy or not. I beg your pardon. What is it? Would you mind releasing my hand? Doman, releasing it. I beg your pardon. Helena, raising her veil. How cautious you have to be here, don't you? Mm, uh, of course. Observing her with deep interest. We, oui, that is... But what is it? What's the matter? I'm remarkably pleased. Did you have a pleasant crossing? Uh, yes. No difficulty? Why? What I mean to say is, you're so young. May we go straight into the factory? Yes. Twenty-two, I think. Twenty-two what? Years. Twenty-one. Why do you want to know? Because, as... You will make a long stay, won't you? That depends on how much of the factory you show me. Oh, hang the factory! Oh, no, no, you will see everything, Miss Glory. Indeed you shall. Won't you sit down? Helena, crossing to couch and sitting. Uh, thank you. But first, would you like to hear the story of the invention? Yes, indeed. Observes Helena with rapture and reels off rapidly. It was in the year 1920 that old Rossum, the great physiologist, who was then quite a young scientist, took himself to this distant island for the purpose of studying the ocean fauna, full stop. On this occasion, he attempted by chemical synthesis to imitate the living matter known as protoplasm, until he suddenly discovered a substance which behaved exactly like living matter, although its chemical composition was different. That was in the year of 1932, exactly 440 years after the discovery of America. Whew! Do you know that by heart? Yes. You see, physiology is not in my line. Shall I go on? Yes, please. Well then, Miss Glory, old Rossum wrote the following among his chemical specimens. Nature has found only one method of organizing living matter. There is, however, another method, more simple, flexible, and rapid, which has not yet occurred to nature at all. This second process by which life can be developed was discovered by me today. Now imagine him, Miss Glory, writing those wonderful words over some colloidal mess that a dog wouldn't look at. Imagine him sitting over a test tube, and thinking how the whole tree of life would grow from it, how all animals would proceed from it, beginning with some sort of beetle and ending with a man. A man of different substance from us, Miss Glory. That was a tremendous moment. Well? Now, the thing was, how to get the life out of the test tube, and hasten development and form organs, bones, and nerves, and so on, and find such substances as catalytics, enzymes, hormones, and so forth, in short. You understand? Uh, not much, I'm afraid. Never mind. You see, with the help of his tinctures, he could make whatever he wanted. He could have produced a Medusa with the brain of a Socrates, or a worm fifty yards long. But being without a grain of humor, he took it into his head to make a vertebrate, or perhaps a man. This artificial living matter of his had a raging thirst for life. It didn't mind being sewn or mixed together. That couldn't be done with natural album. And that's how he set about it. About what? About imitating nature. First of all, he tried making an artificial dog. That took him several years, and resulted in a sort of stunted calf, which died in a few days. I'll show it to you in the museum. And then old Rossum started on the manufacture of man. And I must divulge this to nobody? To nobody in the world. What a pity that it's to be found in all the school books of both Europe and America. 
Yes, but do you know what isn't in the school books? That old Rossum was mad. Seriously, Miss Glory, you must keep this to yourself. The old crank actually wanted to make people. But you do make people. Approximately, Miss Glory. But old Rossum meant it literally. He wanted to become a sort of scientific substitute for God. He was a fearful materialist, and that's why he did it all. His sole purpose was nothing more or less than to prove that God was no longer necessary. Do you know anything about anatomy? Very little. Neither do I. Well, he then decided to manufacture everything as in the human body. I'll show you in the museum the bungling attempt it took him ten years to produce. It was to have been a man, but it lived for three days only. Then up came young Rossum, an engineer. He was a wonderful fellow, Miss Glory. When he saw what a mess of it the old man was making, he said, It's absurd to spend ten years making a man. If you can't make him quicker than nature, you might as well shut up shop. Then he sat about learning anatomy for himself. There's nothing about that in the school books. No, the school books are full of paid advertisements and rubbish at that. What the school books say about the united efforts of the two great Rossums is all a fairy tale. They used to have dreadful rows. The old atheist hadn't the slightest conception of industrial matters, and the end of it was that young Rossum shut him up in some laboratory or other and let him fritter the time away with his monstrosities, while he himself started on the business from an engineer's point of view. Old Rossum cursed him, and before he died he managed to botch up two physiological horrors. Then one day they found him dead in the laboratory, and that's his whole story. And what about the young man? Well... Anyone who has looked into human anatomy will have seen at once that man is too complicated, and that a good engineer could make him more simply. So young Rossum began to overhaul anatomy, and tried to see what could be left out or simplified. In short, but isn't this boring you, Miss Glory? No, indeed, you're... Uh, it's, it's awfully interesting. So young Rossum said to himself, A man is something that feels happy, plays the piano, likes going for a walk, and, in fact, wants to do a whole lot of things that are really unnecessary. Oh. That are unnecessary when he wants, let us say, to weave or count. Do you play the piano? Yes. That's good. But a working machine must not play the piano, must not feel happy, must not do a whole lot of other things. A gasoline motor must not have tassels or ornaments, Miss Glory. And to manufacture artificial workers is the same thing as to manufacture gasoline motors. The process must be of the simplest, and the product of the best from a practical point of view. What sort of worker do you think is the best from a practical point of view? What? What sort of worker do you think is the best from a practical point of view? Perhaps the one who is most honest and hard-working. No, the one that is the cheapest. The one whose requirements are the smallest. Young Rossum invented a worker with the minimum amount of requirements. He had to simplify him. He rejected everything that did not contribute directly to the progress of work, everything that makes man more expensive. In fact, he rejected man and made the robot. My dear Miss Glory, the robots are not people. Mechanically, they are more perfect than we are. They have an enormously developed intelligence, but they have no soul. How do you know they've no soul? Have you ever seen what a robot looks like inside? No. Very neat, very simple. Really, a beautiful piece of work. Not much in it, but everything in flawless order. The product of an engineer is technically at a higher pitch of perfection than a product of nature. But man is supposed to be the product of God. All the worse. God hasn't the least notion of modern engineering. Would you believe that young Rossum then proceeded to play at being God? How do you mean? He began to manufacture super-robots. Regular giants they were. He tried to make them twelve feet tall. But you wouldn't believe what a failure they were. A failure? Yes. For no reason at all, their limbs used to keep snapping off. Evidently, our planet is too small for giants. Now we only make robots of normal size, and of a very high-class human finish. I saw the first robots at home. The town council bought them for, uh, I mean, engaged them for work. Bought them, dear Miss Glory. Robots are bought and sold. These were employed as street sweepers. I saw them sweeping. 
They were so strange and quiet. Rossum's Universal Robot Factory doesn't produce a uniform brand of robots. We have robots of finer and coarser grades. The best will live about twenty years. He rings for Marius. Then they die? Yes, they get used up. Enter Marius. Marius, bring in samples of the manual labor robot. Exit Marius. I'll show you specimens of the two extremes. This first grade is comparatively inexpensive and is made in vast quantities. Marius re-enters with two manual labor robots. There you are, as powerful as a small tractor, guaranteed to have average intelligence. That will do, Marius. Marius exits with robots. They make me feel so strange. Domin rings. Did you see my new typist? He rings for Sulla. I didn't notice her. Enter Sulla. Sulla, let Miss Glory see you. So pleased to meet you. You must find it terribly dull in this out-of-the-way spot, don't you? I don't know, Miss Glory. Where do you come from? From the factory. Oh, you were born there? I was made there. What? Domin, laughing. Sula is a robot. Best grade. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh... Sula isn't angry. Feels the skin on Sula's face. See, Miss Glory, the kind of skin we make? Oh, no, no, I... You wouldn't know that she's made of a different material from us, would you? Turn around, Sula. Oh, stop, stop. Talk to Miss Glory, Sula. Please sit down. Helena sits. Did you have a pleasant crossing? Uh, yes, um, certainly. Don't go back on the Amelia, Miss Glory. The barometer is falling steadily. Wait for the Pennsylvania. That's a good, powerful vessel. What's its speed? Twenty knots. Fifty thousand tons. One of the latest vessels, Miss Glory. Uh, thank you. A crew of fifteen hundred. Captain Harpy. Eight boilers. That'll do, Sula. Now, show us your knowledge of French. You know French? I know four languages. I can write. Dear sir, monsieur, guten Haar, Tony Peng. Helena jumping up. Oh, that's absurd. Sulla isn't a robot. Sulla is a girl like me. Sulla, this is outrageous. Why do you take part in such a hoax? I am a robot. No. No, you are not telling the truth. I know they've forced you to do it for an advertisement. Sulla, you're a girl like me, aren't you? I'm sorry, Miss Glory. Sula is a robot. It's a lie. What? Rings. Excuse me, Miss Glory. Then I must convince you. Enter Marius. Marius, take Sula into the dissecting room and tell them to open her up at once. Where? Into the dissecting room. When they've cut her open, you can go and have a look. No, no. Excuse me. You spoke of lies. You wouldn't have her killed. You can't kill machines. Don't be afraid, Sulla. I won't let you go. Tell me, my dear, are they always so cruel to you? You mustn't put up with it, Sulla. You mustn't. I am a robot. That doesn't matter. Robots are just as good as we are. Sulla, you wouldn't let yourself be cut to pieces? Yes. <laughs> You're not afraid of death, then? I cannot tell, Miss Glory. Do you know what would happen to you in there? Yes. I should cease to move. <laughs> How dreadful. Marius, tell Miss Glory what you are. Marius the robot. Would you take Sula into the dissecting room? Yes. Would you be sorry for her? I cannot tell. What would happen to her? She would cease to move. They would put her into the stamping mill. That is death, Marius. Aren't you afraid of death? No. You see, Miss Glory, the robots have no interest in life. They have no enjoyments. They are less than so much grass. Stop. Send them away. Marius, Sula, you may go. Exunt Sula and Marius. How terrible. It's outrageous what you're doing. Why outrageous? I don't know, but it is. Why do you call her Sulla? Isn't it a nice name? It's a man's name. Sulla was a Roman general. Oh, we thought that Marius and Sulla were lovers. Marius and Sulla were generals and fought against each other in the year... I... Oh, I've forgotten now. Come here to the window. What? Come here. What do you see? Bricklayers. Robots. All our work people are robots. And down there, can you see anything? 
Some sort of office. A counting house. And in it? A lot of officials. Robots. All our officials are robots. And when you see the factory... Factory whistle blows. Noon. We have to blow the whistle because the robots don't know when to stop work. In two hours, I will show you the kneading trough. Kneading trough? The pestle for beating up the paste. In each one, we mix the ingredients for a thousand robots at one operation. Then there are the vats for the preparation of liver, brains, and so on. Then you will see the bone factory. After that, I'll show you the spinning mill. Spinning mill? Yes, for weaving nerves and veins. Miles and miles of digestive tubes pass through it at a time. Mayn't we talk about something else? Perhaps it would be better. There's only a handful of us among a hundred thousand robots, and not one woman. We talk about nothing but the factory all day, every day. It's just as if we were under a curse, Miss Glory. I'm sorry I said that you were lying. A knock at the door. Come in! From the right, enter Mr. Fabry, Dr. Gall, Dr. Hallemeyer, Mr. Elquist. I beg your pardon. I hope we don't intrude. Come in, Miss Glory. Here are Alquist, Fabry, Gall, Hallmeyer. This is President Glory's daughter. How do you do? We had no idea. Highly honored, I'm sure. Welcome, Miss Glory. Busman rushes in from the right. Hello, what's up? Come in, Busman. This is Busman, Miss Glory. This is President Glory's daughter. By Jove, that's fine. Miss Glory, may we send a cablegram to the papers about your arrival? No, no, please don't. Sit down, please, Miss Glory. Allow me. Dragging up armchairs. Please. Excuse me. What sort of a crossing did you have? Are you going to stay long? What do you think of the factory, Miss Glory? Did you come over on the Amelia? Be quiet, and let Miss Glory speak. Helena, to Doman. What am I to speak to them about? Anything you like. Shall... May I speak quite frankly? Why, of course. Tell me, uh, doesn't it... Doesn't it ever distress you, the way you are treated? By whom, may I ask? Why, everybody. Treated? What makes you think... Don't you feel that you might be living a better life? Well, that depends on what you mean, Miss Glory. I, I, I mean that it's perfectly outrageous. It's terrible. Standing up. The whole of Europe is talking about the way you're being treated. That's why I came here, to see for myself, and it's, it's a thousand times worse than could have been imagined. How can you put up with it? Put up with what? Good heavens, you're living creatures just like us, like the whole of Europe, like the whole world. It's disgraceful that you must live like this. Good gracious, Miss Glory. Well, she's not far wrong. We live here just like Red Indians. Worse than Red Indians. May I... Oh, may I call you brothers? Why not? Brothers, I have not come here as the President's daughter. I have come on behalf of the Humanity League. Brothers, the Humanity League now has over 200,000 members. 200,000 people are on your side and offer you their help. 200,000 people? Miss Glory, that's a tidy lot. Not bad. I'm always telling you, there's nothing like good old Europe. You see, they've not forgotten us. They're offering us help. What help? A theater, for instance? An orchestra? More than that. Just you? Oh, never mind about me. I'll stay as long as it is necessary. By Jove, that's good. Domin, I'm going to get the best room ready for Miss Glory. Just a minute. I'm afraid that Miss Glory is of the opinion that she has been talking to robots. Of course. I'm sorry. These gentlemen are human beings just like us. Uh, y you're not robots. Not robots. Robots indeed. No thanks. Upon my honor, Miss Glory, we ain't robots. Helena, to Doman. Then why did you tell me that all your officials are robots? Yes, the officials, but not the managers. Allow me, Miss Glory. This is Mr. Fabry, General Technical Manager of RUR, Dr. Gall. Head of the Psychological and Experimental Department. Dr. Hallemeyer, Head of the Institute for the Psychological Training of Robots. Council Busman, General Business Manager. And Alquist, Head of the Building Department of RUR. Just a builder. Excuse me, gentlemen, for... for... um... Have I done something dreadful? Not at all, Miss Glory. Please, sit down. I'm a stupid girl. Send me back by the first ship. 
Not for anything in the world, Miss Glory. Why should we send you back? Because you know I've come to disturb your robots for you. My dear Miss Glory, we've had close upon a hundred saviors and prophets here. Every ship brings us some. Missionaries, anarchists, Salvation Army, all sorts. It's astonishing what a number of churches and idiots there are in the world. And you let them speak to the robots? So far, we've let them all. Why not? The robots remember everything, but that's all. They don't even laugh at what the people say. Really, it is quite incredible. If it would amuse you, Miss Glory, I'll take you over to the robot warehouse. It holds about 300,000 of them. 347,000. Good. And you can say whatever you like to them. You can read the Bible, recite the multiplication table, whatever you please. You can even preach to them about human rights. Oh, I think that if you were to show them a little love... Impossible, Miss Glory. Nothing is harder to like than a robot. What do you make them for, then? <laughs> That's good. What are robots made for? For work, Miss Glory. One robot can replace two and a half workmen. The human machine, Miss Glory, it was terribly imperfect. It had to be removed sooner or later. It was too expensive. It was not effective. It no longer answers the requirements of modern engineering. Nature has no idea of keeping pace with modern labor. For example, from a technical point of view, the whole of childhood is a sheer absurdity. So much time lost. And then again... Oh, no, no! Pardon me, but kindly tell me what is the real aim of your league, the... the Humanity League? Its real purpose is to... to protect the robots and... Uh, and ensure good treatment for them. Not a bad object, either. A machine has to be treated properly. Upon my soul, I approve of that. I don't like damaged articles. Please, Miss Glory, enroll us all as your contributing or regular foundation members of your league. No, you don't. You don't understand me. What we really want is to... to liberate the robots. How do you propose to do that? They are to be... to be dealt with like human beings. <laughs> ah, I suppose they're to vote, uh, to drink beer, to order us about. Why shouldn't they drink beer? Uh, perhaps they're even to receive wages. Of course they are. <laughs> Fancy that now. And what would they do with their wages, pray? Hmm? Uh, they would buy what what they need, what pleases them. That would be very nice, Miss Glory. Only there's nothing that does please the robots. Good heavens, what are they to buy? You can feed them on pineapples, straw, whatever you like. It's all the same to them. They've no appetite at all. They've no interest in anything, Miss Glory. Why, hang it all, nobody's ever yet seen a robot smile. Why? Why don't you make them happier? That wouldn't do, Miss Glory. They are only workmen. But they're so intelligent. Confoundedly so, but they're nothing else. They've no will of their own, no passion, no soul. No love. Love? <laughs> Rather not. Robots don't love. Not even themselves. Nor defiance. Defiance? Uh, I don't know. Uh, only rarely, from time to time. What? Uh, nothing particular. Uh, occasionally they seem to go off their heads. Uh, something like epilepsy, you know. It's called robot's cramp. They'll suddenly sling down everything they're holding, stand still, gnash their teeth, and then they have to go into the stamping mill. It's evidently some breakdown in the mechanism. A flaw in the works that has to be removed. No, no, that's the soul. You think the soul first shows itself by a gnashing of teeth? Perhaps it's a sort of revolt. Perhaps it's just a sign that there's a struggle within. Oh, if you could just infuse them with it. That'll be remedied, Miss Glory. Dr. Gall is just making some experiments. Not with regard to that, Doman. At present I am making pain nerves. Pain nerves? Yes, the robots feel practically no bodily pain. You see, young Rossum provided them with too limited a nervous system. We must introduce suffering. Why do you want to cause them pain? For industrial reasons, Miss Glory, sometimes a robot does damage to himself because it doesn't hurt him. He puts his hand into the machine, breaks his finger, smashes his head. It's all the same to him. We must provide them with pain. That's an automatic protection against damage. Will they be happier when they feel pain? 
On the contrary, but they will be more perfect from a technical point of view. Why don't you create a soul for them? That's not in our power. That's not in our interests. That would increase the cost of production. Hang it all, my dear young lady, we turn them out at such a cheap rate. A hundred and fifty dollars each fully dressed. And fifteen years ago they cost ten thousand. Five years ago we used to buy the clothes for them. Today we have our own weaving mill, and now we even export cloth five times cheaper than other factories. What do you pay a yard for cloth, Miss Glory? I don't know, really. I've, I've forgotten. Good gracious, and you want to found a humanity league? It only costs a third now, Miss Glory. All prices are today a third of what they were, and they'll fall still lower, 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 like that. I don't understand. Why, bless you, Miss Glory, it means that the cost of labor has fallen. A robot, food and all, costs three quarters of a cent per hour. That's mighty important, you know. All factories will go pop like chestnuts if they don't at once buy robots to lower the cost of production. And get rid of their workmen. Of course. But in the meantime, we've dumped 500,000 tropical robots down on the Argentine pampas to grow corn. Would you mind telling me how much you pay a pound for bread? I have no idea. Well, I'll tell you. It now costs two cents in good old Europe. A pound of bread for two cents, and the Humanity League knows nothing about it. Miss Glory, you don't realize that even that's too expensive. Why, in five years' time, I'll wager... What? That the cost of everything won't be a tenth of what it is now. Why, in five years, we'll be up to our ears in corn and everything else. Yes, and all the workers throughout the world will be unemployed. Yes, Alquist, they will. Yes, Miss Glory, they will. But in ten years, Rossum's Universal Robots will produce so much corn, so much cloth, so much everything, that things will be practically without price. There will be no poverty. All work will be done by living machines. Everybody will be free from worry and liberated from the degradation of labor. Everybody will live only to perfect himself. Will he? Of course. It's bound to happen. But then the servitude of man to man and the enslavement of man to matter will cease. Of course, terrible things may happen at first, but that simply can't be avoided. Nobody will get bread at the price of life and hatred. The robots will wash the feet of the beggar and prepare a bed for him in his house. Domin, Domin. What you say sounds too much like paradise. There was something good in service and something great in humility. There was some kind of virtue in toil and weariness. Perhaps, but we cannot reckon with what is lost when we start out to transform the world. Man will be free and supreme. He shall have no other aim, no other labor, no other care than to perfect himself. He shall serve neither matter nor man. He will not be a machine and a device for production. He will be Lord of creation. Amen. So be it. You have bewildered me. I, I should like, I should like to believe this, but... You are younger than we are, Miss Glory. You will live to see it. Hmm, true. Don't you think Miss Glory might lunch with us? Of course, Doman. Ask on behalf of us all. Miss Glory, will you do us the honor? When you know why I've come... For the League of Humanity, Miss Glory. <sighs> In that case, perhaps. That's fine. Miss Glory, excuse me for five minutes. Pardon me too, dear Miss Glory. I won't be long. We're all very glad you've come. We'll be back in exactly five minutes. All rush out except Doman and Helena. What have they all gone off for? To cook, Miss Glory. To cook what? Lunch. The robots do our cooking for us, and as they've no taste, it's not altogether... Hollemeyer's awfully good at grills. And Gall can make a kind of a sauce, and Bustman knows all about omelets. <laughs> what a feast. And what's the specialty of Mr., um, your, your builder? Alquist? Nothing. He only lays the table. And Fabry will get together a little fruit. Our cuisine is very modest, Miss Glory. I wanted to ask you something. And I wanted to ask you something, too. Looking at watch. Five minutes. What did you want to ask me? Excuse me. You asked first. Perhaps it's silly of me, but why 
Why do you manufacture female robots when... Uh, well, when... When sex means nothing to them? Yes. There's a certain demand for them, you see. Servants, saleswomen, stenographers. People are used to it. But... But tell me, are... Are robots, male and female, mutually... Completely without... Completely indifferent to each other, Miss Glory. There's no sign of any affection between them. Oh, that's terrible. Why? It's so unnatural. One doesn't know whether to be disgusted or to hate them, or perhaps... To pity them? That's more like it. What did you want to ask me about? I should like to ask you, Miss Helena, whether you would marry me. What? Will you be my wife? <laughs> no! The idea! Doman, looking at his watch. Another three minutes. If you won't marry me, you'll have to marry one of the other five. <laughs> but why should I? Because they're all going to ask you in turn. How could they dare do such a thing? I'm very sorry, Miss Glory. It seems they've all fallen in love with you. <laughs> Please, don't let them. I'll... I'll go away at once. Helena, you wouldn't be so cruel as to refuse us. <laughs> but... But I... I can't marry all six. No, but one anyhow. If you don't want me, marry Fabry. I won't. Dr. Gall? I don't want any of you. Doman again looking at his watch. Hmm, another two minutes. <laughs> I think you'd marry any woman who came here. Plenty of them have come, Helena. Young? Yes. Why didn't you marry one of them? Because I didn't lose my head until today. Then, as soon as you lifted your veil... Helena turns her head away. Hmm, another minute. But I don't want you, I tell you. Doman laying both hands on her shoulders. One more minute. Now, you either have to look me straight in the eye and say no violently, and then I'll leave you alone, or... Helena looks at him, Helena turning away. You're mad! A man has to be a bit mad, Helena. It's the best thing about him. You are... you're... Well? Don't, you're hurting me. The last chance, Helena. Now or never. But... but Harry... He embraces and kisses her, knocking at the door, Doman releasing her. Come in. Enter Busman, Dr. Gall, and Hellemeyer in kitchen aprons, Fabry with bouquet, and Elquist with napkin over his arm. Have you finished your job? Yes. So have we. For a moment the men stand nonplussed, but as soon as they realize what Doman means they rush forward, congratulating Helena and Doman as the curtain falls. End of Act One